If there is a particular uh, strand in my work that I think is profound and yet maybe to be appreciated is that I didn't import concepts from place to place but actually subordinated myself to trying to understand the essence of a place. Design is about making things work and fit and respond to their purpose. And that is for me the kind of checklist of is my architecture timeless? Is it responsive in such a way that it's likely to be meaningful on a long-term basis? In my early parts of my career, I was quite obsessed with geometry and with the notion of creating three-dimensional spatial components as building blocks for construction. Habitat is an example where boxes form houses. But then I tried to carry that thought process to other typologies. At some point I realized that different typologies require different systems and that there's a wide variety of building systems, all of which could lead to a wider variety of expressions. So this was a big lesson, a lesson of the, the language of my building. As an architect committed to building and impacting the environment, to design without the intention of building is a failure by definition because it's not architecture. For those who design in order to build, not succeeding in building is not a failure. There are different reasons why things don't get built, but they form a fascinating track through one's thoughts and careers. Probably more than 50% of my work is unbuilt. When I review that unbuilt work, some of it is the most significant work I've done. The Habitat 67 that got built is one-fifth of the original complex. Had the original been built, perhaps the course of architecture in this century would have been different. When you've been an architect 50 years and you already had three buildings demolished, and you see the transformation that's taking place. Very little or none of it is forever. I've seen architecture go from profound concerns for society as a whole to a period of interest in tantalizing society by the possibilities of architecture. I've seen the public awed by certain buildings because of their notoriety for a while, but there's a quality of being impressed and there's a quality of affection and loving something. I go to Habitat today, it's 50 years old and not just to my mind but almost to every observer, it's as fresh as ever, it's as relevant as ever. You know, after years of being semi-ignored, all of a sudden the ideas of Habitat are all over the place. The question of contemporary has to do with the values a building represents. Contemporary building is one that seizes the spirit of the time as well as the technology of the time in a way that has meaning that, that lasts. Habitat uh, 67 was built for the World's Fair in 1967 and it grew out of my scholarship trip to study housing in North America where I traveled in 1959, just before doing my thesis. And in fact, it was my thesis that then became the project I built for the World's Fair when I was in charge of master planning it. I saw everybody either living in high-rise buildings and hating it, the buildings of the 60s and 50s, or wishing for the suburb if they could afford it. And I came to the conclusion we've got to reinvent the apartment building. We need to find a way of doing apartment buildings where you have the quality of life of a house. Or we need to pile up houses one on top of the other instead of thinking of them as, as apartment blocks. And they ought to have gardens and they ought to have streets and they ought to have multiple exposures rather than, you know, this kind of uh, 
cell block. And I bought out all the Legos in Montreal at the time because we built many, many alternatives. The two to one brick was perfect. It didn't have the overhang that we eventually had in the box, but it did allow you to do all the cluster studies and it was very convenient. And lo and behold, we built a building where everybody felt, yeah, that is like being in a house and loved it. For convenience, we prefabricated it. In terms of livability, it all survived. The building is loved, is inhabited intensely, is cared for. So, I mean, the only question about habitat is not whether it's appreciated, it's can we replicate it? Because the, the reaction first was, this is wonderful, but we'll never be able to do it again. You did it for a World's Fair, but how could you do it in the marketplace? Well, today we're beginning to apply this on a big scale in Singapore and China in ways that we could not conceive of in the past. I not only did not see it as a brutalist building, but well, be, before uh, building Habitat, I traveled. I saw Le Corbusier in Chandigarh. Uh, I saw the rough concrete uh, cast kind of in, in its roughness. And actually, I wanted Habitat to look like a highly finished, sophisticated product, which is why I went to precasting. And I worked very hard to get formwork that would give you really a smooth, machine-like surface rather than a brutal, rough surface, and the boxes come together as very pure geometry. So I think of it as an anti-brutalist building, reaction to brutalism. It just happened to be built in that period, but it wasn't a brutalist building. That as we approach our 10th anniversary, we're making plans to expand Crystal Bridges. You came to me and said, we might want to expand Crystal Bridges, <laughs> And why don't you make a master plan for what we might do over 25 years? That was the beginning of this adventure. And I remember the moment where he said, why do I have to wait 25 years? The need is right now. <laughs> yes, I think, you know, people in this region, it, there was such a deficit of art in this region as a whole. And to think that all the children growing up in this region now have access to art as a part of their education is probably the most fulfilling thing I've ever done. It served the people of Northwest Arkansas. It's drawn people from across the country. I know people who've flown from other countries to visit. So I think if this would have been just a museum, like in the traditional sense, it might have intimidated people. But your vision that it should be extrovert, inviting, unintimidating, and diverse in its offerings and diverse in its patrons. And so I can't wait to show you the model and walk you through the various parts and pieces of it. It's so lifelike, it's almost as if it's been built. <laughs> Here we are, you used to come down into an open courtyard and then enter the bridge uh, structure where 11 is, we are now covering this with a glass dome and integrating this whole entrance experience to serve both going south and going north. As we move towards the north, we'll be moving through the existing galleries and then we come to a second, a second loop downstream. The pond will descend by about 12 feet into a lower pond, but that will now be integrated with gardens, with a big event space. We have the education complex, studios, classrooms at the lower level of this building on the east side. And above it is the grand gallery for changing exhibitions. And from there, we descend to this bridge, which will have a whole series of exhibits. And it could show all kinds of work that can be experienced with light. Coming around, there's yet one more gallery. It will be a wood structure like the others. We're also creating this tent which is suspended off the surrounding buildings. So this becomes very useful expansion of the education spaces which surround it. To me, this expansion is really gonna be the capstone 
in that original vision about really making it a community center and a place for community Absolutely. because I think that it will connect us more to nature and the outside uh, even more so than the, than the current uh, building footprint.